So you said that you lived in St. Pete until you were in 8th grade or 7th grade? Uh, after 7th uh, grade, we moved to Miami for, for one year. For one year. Got possibly on junior high. That's when my life started. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Ah, uh, yeah. Because those are the friends that I still have today. Is that when you started playing saxophone too? No, well, it was much later. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Burnett was in that band, McGinnis, and... Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Huh, Ash. Yeah. Ash was in it, yeah. Okay. So, uh, we, I was there for a year, and then we went to uh, Gainesville. And that wasn't a bad experience, really. It was a small high school. It was K-12 through in Gainesville, because Gainesville is still a small town. That's where University of Florida is. Okay. And they had a real good band director, Mr. Uh, um, so at what point did you move to Miami and then went to um, Cuba? I want to hear about that story. Oh, oh, okay. Well, Cuba's story starts with my dad. He went there when he was, uh, mm, yeah, I guess he was in his 30s probably. He hitchhiked to Key West mm -hmm. from St. Pete and then there was an auto ferry that ran to Havana. He boarded the auto ferry only 90 miles from Key West to Havana. Yeah, that's all I do. And, uh, and then he just he just hiked up in the island, up and down the island, and, you know, soaked in the culture and the music, and then came back home. Wow. Yeah. So when I went there, was I was in the 10th grade, so it was in 1953 or 54. Uh, we went down and played their, their uh, what the equivalent of the Mardi Gras parade in, uh, in New Orleans. It was their pre-Lenten celebration. And the parade, the parade was... Uh, we were there three days, I'm not sure why, but we were. Uh, it was us, Miami Edison Band, Miami Jackson, Miami High, so four high school bands that were 200 each, thereabouts, and a motorcycle drill team from the Miami Police Department with their Harleys parked on the fantail, and it was a, it was the destroyer escort, it was a DE, that's a tiny little ship mm -hmm. that was on Lindley, so a gift from the American Navy to the Cubans. It was a mess, yeah. But that's what we went down on anyway. And then we were down there in uh, four days, four days it was, and we stayed at the Hotel Inglaterra, and uh, the girls stayed at the Temper Hotel. And uh, we, I just spent a lot of time, we spent a lot of time walking the streets, and there were four days before the parade happened, they were already starting, the parade was starting. There were musicians walking up and down the sidewalk playing trumpets and, and with, you know, percussion instruments. And then it would be a larger group of guys doing it. And then all of a sudden there's a band. It's, and then the parade lasted, oh well, God, it lasted for hours because everybody stopped and did a performance for Batista. You know who that was? Pre Castro. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, they eventually had to move all the girls to the inside of the band because there were people, there were men that were being rude, let's say, very rude. Yeah. But the music thought, you know, I heard that. Well, I used to listen to. Radio Havana on a short, we had a shortwave radio, and I listened to that as a kid. I heard Cuban music, that's where I first heard it. And I never got over it. Yeah. yeah. That's the end of the Cuban story. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to pause it for a second, because okay. we already have been quite a Okay. Eventually, you finished your high school career in Miami mm -hmm. at Coral Gables High School. Mm -hmm. 
So tell us something about that. I'll tell you something about that. Well, stop it. The circus. Stop. The circus. So I had a friend in high school, a drummer named Bobby Messing, that was a circus nut. He was a, a love. All he wanted to do was play drums at the circus band. Uh, the uh, band leader's name was Joe Basil. He played the cornet and he, and he kept time with it by puffing his it's torn. Right? So Messing said that he once saw the drummer in the circus band. He, he drank constantly, the drummer did in the band. But he could make he could play a role with one hand and drink bourbon with the other. <laughs> Which I never really believed. But anyway, so uh, we had a circus band anyway. Then we played it was McGinnis, no, McGinnis was it? Burnett, Ash, myself, Messing, and I figured who the bass player was. But we played all these circus marches, and they give us a little spot at the concerts. You know, the, the high school band played the concerts. They give us a little, a little shot. We played a little. Uh, Billboard march or Remember that one? Circus Symphony. Yeah, so that circus carried on. You know, I, I still love the circus. I do. I, I don't love the fact that they abuse the animals like they did and they don't anymore, so that's the good part. You know, what they treated those elephants, my God, you know. Well, all, all, with all the cats and everything. So, yeah, I love the circus. Yeah. So we skipped over how you uh, discovered the saxophone and started playing music for the oh. clarinet and oh, okay. well, a musician. Well, I was in high school band and I uh, played in a Dixieland band with McGinnis and those guys called the Aristocats. And I played clarinet. I didn't play saxophone at all. But one day they, were, they said they were going to have tryouts for a big band. And I thought, hmm, maybe I'll try that. So I went into the instrument storage area and I found this old saxophone. That belonged to the school, I guess. Old piece of crap, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I never played one before. I came out and uh, I can remember the tune. It was a Little Round Jug, a Glenn Miller's arrangement. And I played a little solo on it. And they went nuts. Wow! You know, I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. Honest to God. I didn't, I didn't even know how to do that. I said, do what? I don't, what did I do, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so that's how I started playing. No and I, then I quit right away. <laughs> yeah, because I, our Dixie Line band interfered with. Uh, the big band, the, the Tropical Nights. I played maybe one or two gigs with them. Okay. But uh, and we got fifteen dollars. Yeah, yeah, which was <laughs> a lot of money back then compared to what you make. Well, anyway, so we uh, we we concentrated on our Dixieland band, and then we had a guy, uh, Eddie Graham, mm -hmm. was actually a, he was a graduate of Miami Edison High School, and he was already enrolled at the University of Miami. Oh wow! And he was he was a year ahead of us. And he was the one that was the spark plug for getting this audition. First, we auditioned for the Arthur Godfrey Talent Scouts, right, in Miami. And uh, <laughs> we didn't even decide what we were going to play before we got there. So we were not prepared, to say the least. Really? So we said, let's play Mambo Jumbo. <laughs> I've got a chart, you know. And I said, that's a, a fast Mambo. <laughs> We stopped and said, next. <laughs> that was the end of that. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. Oops. So uh, Graham fixed us up with an audition with the, uh, with, uh, the uh, Ted Mac original amateur hour, mm -hmm. right, which used to be the Major Bose amateur hour many years ago. And uh, we auditioned at the Miami Beach Auditorium. It was set up for boxing. There was a boxing ring in the middle of this big auditorium, big, big uh, uh, kind of coliseum-looking thing. And... Uh, we got in the, in the boxing ring and played. We did rehearse. Thank God we decided what we were going to do. And uh, we played a little blues and a little uh, whatever. It wasn't very good. But anyway, <laughs> we got to the end of the tune. And the end, the end of the tune went... Da, 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 bang! Right? Okay. Well, Eddie Graham, <laughs> we got to the end. He grabbed his, took his cowbell off his bass drum. And ran across the doxing ring like dee, 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 conk conk on the cowbell, and then he leaped and slid over to the bell, and they ding hit the bell, and, left. and that's why we got on the show. I swear no. to God, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And so that was that was the main thing I did in high school was at Dixieland, and a really really good concert band and marching band, really good band director that I really didn't like very much. He was a retired army band. 
band master was, a, I think he was a warrant officer or something tall. Uh, he looked like a, well, he had been a heavyweight boxer at one point. And, and he used to regale us with stories of his boxing career. One time he told us that, he says, yeah, the guy hit me right here like that, my eyeball just popped out on my chest. Oh, wow. Yeah, but he was a really good musician and conductor. He really was. I didn't really know that at the time. I just thought he was a big asshole. But he really, I mean, I learned so much. And I learned everything I knew about music in that band, really, from playing clarinet in that concert band. So, uh, so he, uh... Was he an influence for you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, he was. And we... Coral Gables, hands down, the best concert band. There were the big four. It was Miami High, Miami, this was Miami Jackson. Coral Gables was the new school, the new kid on the block. Got our asses kicked in football the first. My sister was graduated in 52 or 3, whatever, the first year that it was in existence. And they called it, of course, the sports teams were terrible. Well, my senior year, my senior year was the first time that they beat all three. We beat all three of the big three. The big four. So we were the champs, the city champs. And that was, yeah, I, I, that was Dixieland Band and the Concert Band, and I was just a great bunch of kids. I mean, that school was a, it was a wealthy school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, there were people, there were kids there that uh, really, really had, they had like chauffeur driven uh, Cadillacs and bring them to school in the morning. Seriously. <laughs> yeah. And then I was there with me and my 1951 Kaiser. School, great education, man. I'm telling you, the teachers were just fantastic. Every one of them. I never had one that wasn't. <laughs> then I, my history teacher. Oh, oh, see, was that high school or college? Let's see. Oh, that was in college. Yeah, St. Pete Junior College. I just confused the two. I had I had to write a paper on uh, for what was that? Was some a literature? It was Brit Lit or something? I don't know. Anyway, I had to write a paper, and I had. Unlimited cuts the second semester I was there because I had all A's. So, you know, I could cut class anytime I wanted to, which I did. <laughs> yeah. So, then my English teacher, I wrote a, I wrote a uh, John Steinbeck was the subject of my paper that I wrote. And uh, <laughs> he, uh, he gave me a B on it. He said, you didn't solve the riddle of John Steinbeck. So, oh, okay, anyway, that's fair. So, one day I'm walking past, down the sidewalk in his, his, <laughs> in his room, he said, Mr. Biggles! <laughs> I said, oh, well, yes. It was during class, you know. He says, I thought you might like to have your paper back. And he handed it to the window to me. 
So I didn't, I, I, you could say I didn't really apply myself. This was in college. This was junior college. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. My grades didn't do, they weren't quite as good the second semester, but they were fine. I, you yeah. know, I had good grades. <laughs> yeah, and then there's some, I think everybody just about that was in the band has moved to northern Florida, the state of Florida, because of the, the uh, shift in ethnicity. Yeah, I, it, you know, I got a little taste of that. Mom and I went down to, uh, to Miami for a physical, right? When I was coming back in. And uh, I went to a, into a drugstore and they didn't speak English and they were very rude because I didn't speak Spanish. And my, you know, what? Not, wait a minute, this is, you know. Yeah, I, I got that, I got a little taste of that. It's not real pleasant, I'll tell you, it really isn't. So, uh, I don't know, it's something I'd throw in there. I can understand why people feel threatened. You know, I really can. I don't, but I can understand what you do. Uh, I don't, I'm not worried about competing. You know, I've always been able to compete. You know? I'm not afraid that black people or Latin people or Asian people are going to be taking my job. That's what they're worried about. And I'm not. I, I did. I lived it. I, you know, I, 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 I competed. And I didn't win every time, but I'm very glad I, I competed. And I'm not worried about it. If they would just get a hold of themselves and learn how to adjust, you know, to a, a to new, new reality. I heard, man, when I heard, and this was like 30, 40 years ago, that the the balance of, of uh, population balance was gonna shift in this country and people were gonna be minority, were gonna be white people. This was 30, 40 years ago. Oh boy. Mm -hmm. mm. It didn't bother me in the least. Not in the least. I'll, I'll figure out how to, how to go how to do that. Yeah, I like Latin people or yeah. black people. I like them a lot. Exactly. I'm not worried about it. They, they just shut up and use their heads and then say, okay, wait a minute, I can fit in here. I can do this, you know? I can get along. I can get a job, you know? You know they're, not, they're not threatening me. I'm threatening them. So, there's that. <laughs> yeah, I know you didn't ask me that. But. No, but that's, that's a good, that reminds me of what I wanted to ask you. Living in it in the South and in the 50s during segregation time. That's a good lead in for that. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I remember, uh, I certainly, I never went to, to public school with a black person or a Latin, well, there were some, there were some Latinos. But yeah, I was all white people, man. I never went to school with my entire, you know, not until, uh, even in junior college, not until I got in the name that I have go to school with anybody that wasn't white. Okay. Yeah. What year was that? 1960. Yeah, I was 21. Yeah, I had never been, uh, yeah, well, not no day. Uh, let me backtrack there. Uh, I had contact with, with the black musicians when I was in college. Okay. Yeah, I did. But I had no other opportunity, you know? It, it didn't exist. I can remember when I was a kid, they had separate water fountains. I couldn't believe it or not. And I don't re ever remember my parents telling me that's wrong. I just knew it was wrong. I guess they did, by example, but they, 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 never, they never sat us down and said, nah, you don't do this. You never had conversations about not it? Not really. I, I can remember my mom, uh, we had never used the N word, that never happened. But she, I can remember her saying, you'll never use that word, that's a horrible word. And that's all, the only thing I can remember on this subject, as far as, race or getting along with people or, you know, they don't, it's not like they harped on it or they, tra they trained us a certain way. I guess it's just my example. And my papa was a social worker. So yeah, well, he was, eventually he was. He wasn't when I was growing up, but yeah, well, he was our, I mean, he was a mind. He was a social worker at the time he was born, you know, Absolutely. yeah, very benevolent, caring, you know. Seems like Nana came from a, a place of, like, public service, too, and, you yeah. know, community. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so uh, as far as uh, so you don't race. Have anything that stuck out? About what? Anything, just in that time period. Oh, you mean as far as the uh, segregation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, <laughs> my mother's family didn't quite feel the same way. I certainly remember that. Uh, the N word flew every time we went to And we, all, all of us were uncomfortable. My, family, my sister, my mom, and dad, and I, uncomfortable, you know, and we wouldn't stay long. But they do it anyway, you know. I, I, it would take a while for them to work up to it. Yeah, I, Jesus, I can't really think. And then, of course, on my dad's side, the Harmons were the same way. They were the same way. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
My mammy would, would jump all over them, you know, my Uncle Ray. That, so, how about having Larry Burnett as a Jewish friend? Is that something that ah. stuck out to you? Or no, just, just no. Just no. Your Jewish friend no. Yeah, did, no. Did he said his mom assumed that you were Jewish at some point? Oh, that was Bobby Messing. Oh, yeah, I used, to, okay. I used to go spend the night and she'd cook. She'd give me bagels and uh, cream cheese in the morning for breakfast. <laughs> and I went, so, you know, Ben, they've been going on for a long time. And she says, ah, I thought you were Jewish. I'm sorry I gave you the bagels. And I was like, oh, oh they were great. You know? No, Larry's family, oh, boy, I mean, damn. Yeah. <laughs> His dad was on Larry's ass constantly, constantly. Yeah, never stopped. And he were, they were back and forth all the time. But he, uh, Larry, he bought Larry a 1956 Chevy 210 with a, black, with a power pack, okay? Dual exhaust, Chris shifter. It was fast for that day, you know? And he had a 1954 Chevrolet which was a dog. I mean, up until 1955, Chevys all had straight six engines and they were dogs, all of them. And one time, uh, uh, he, let's see. Oh, he, he, his dad decided he was going to take Larry's car because it was so much nicer. So that, that battle started. And I can remember one time, he took the lug nuts off of Larry's car. Mm. And Larry took the lug nuts off of his car and he didn't know it. <laughs> he drove off. <laughs> yeah, all four wheels. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, yeah. Jeez. Yeah. I he used to call him a bum. You bum, you join the army. <laughs> Larry. Yeah, they never cursed. They never did. They never really? did. No, no. Man. No. no. That was amazing. Ah, and here's the thing. I, I just I told us I told Larry this years. I mean, recently, within the past few years, when I was I was in the hospital. When I was in the senior in high school. I had mononucleosis. Mm. Followed shortly after that by hepatitis. Oh my God! So I spent a good time in the hospital, a good amount of time. And uh, Larry's dad came to visit me, and Larry never knew that, because I remember it distinctly because he came in and they had they had the rails up, you know. And he he says uh, he says to me, Mike, you know one thing, whatever they put the rails up, that means the patient's gonna die. <laughs> He's kidding, of course. Yeah, yeah. Sounds like a comfort. Yeah. Oh, man. So, you know, Jewish, Protestant, I didn't, uh, Catholic, I didn't uh, make any difference yeah. to me. Yeah. Uh, you know, I didn't judge people by that. I just, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I just did. Um, I also remember you telling a story about the Glee Club and the spaghetti incident. Would you like to talk oh. about that? <laughs> like, describe the spaghetti incident? Oh, good lord. Yeah, okay. Uh, that would be the uh, great spaghetti throw that you're referring to. <laughs> Your yeah, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, the background, they had, they were, actually they were fraternities, but they called them uh, service clubs in high school. You know, illegal to have a fraternity, but they were. And sororities. So, uh, there was one, Wheel Club was sponsored by the Rotary Club. Wheel Club, right? And uh, they, all the clubs had a horn on us, a horn on you know, they greet each other. Beep, 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 right? The guy would answer down the street, right? So, this is already stupid, right? But, so, well, I thought, yeah, I'm getting ahead of myself. I got to know that part, though. So, we're driving along in Burnett's car, me and Ash and McGinnis and Burnett, and uh, all of a sudden, a big glob of spaghetti hits Burnett's car. Wham! You know, like, I mean, a huge, yeah. And it was, what, what the hell? So, it was a, it was a, 58 Buick, black, four-door, that did it. And Burnett said, I never get this! He went up and we pulled up behind him and eight of them got out of the car. Oh my God. Eight of them. Burnett says, all right, wait a minute. <laughs> so we took off and went all the way, and they chased us, all the way from Coral Gables into Miami. Oh. And Burnett was headed to the to the uh, Elks Club because there was a, uh, these, these criminals that he knew were having a meeting there. <laughs> they were gang or something, I don't know what they were, but he was going to go get some reinforcements at the Elks Club okay. and kick these guys' asses, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, he drives up to the Elks Club. It's a lot of traffic. There are maybe one or two cars behind us, right? We're in a traffic light. And Bernard says, you drive! So I get in the car. 
And uh, he runs into the Elks Club to get, I can't remember the guy's name, but to get him to get his boys and come out. And uh, the light changed, and I, oh, no, the light's red, and I drove through the light. There were cops right on the corner on the opposite side. It's Caddy Corner, a couple of motorcycle cops, I don't know, they're having a meeting over there or something. So I said, watch this. I, I ran the red light, right? And they <laughs> fell for down. I stopped right away. And they said, what are you doing? I said, see that, that Buick back there? Those guys chased us all the way from Coral Gables. They're trying to, I don't know what they're trying to do, but they chased us. And they said, what? They went back and busted them all. They <laughs> got them out of the car, right? <laughs> now this, these guys, the mayor's son. No. Oh yeah. These were all rich kids. Oh. Wheel Club, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, they, they took them up to, the, four of them were new juveniles, four were 18, they were adults. They took them up to the top floor of the courthouse. The jail's up in the top. Oh. The city jail. Okay. So, uh, or maybe the county, the city jail. So they put these guys in jail, four of them up there. Oh. And we went up and visited them. <laughs> hey, you guys, what's up? <laughs> So, uh, man, get us out of here. Tell him, tell him it's all right. I said, oh, well, I don't know what to do, man. I can't, I can't help you on that. You gotta help yourself on that. You know? They had a trial. They had a trial. We go to the trial, and uh, uh, we're standing, me and Burdett, off McGinnis and Ash were both. I think Ash was a minor. He wasn't there. He wasn't involved. I don't think McGinnis was there either. It was me and Burnett standing in front of the judge's big, huge desk, and Burnett's cracking up, of course. <laughs> You know, <laughs> and uh, we're standing there, and uh, there's, there's some pictures on the on the bench. The the judge and Burnett picks them up and starts looking at him. His picture of his car with spaghetti all over it. <laughs> and then he's like, <laughs> and he goes, "I'll hold you in contempt." Now he puts the pictures back, <laughs> and uh, uh, we're uh, <laughs> we're standing out there waiting. So they call the cop. They call the, uh, the judge, you know, the, the cop's going to testify. He says, what was this incident about, your uh, uh, officer? He said, well, sir, the, uh, the, all the clubs, they have a horn honk that they use. You know, the wheel club, they got a honk, and they all, all got a honk. And uh, they say that these boys did the wheel club honk and then beep, beep. And the judge says, what does beep, beep mean? He says, eat shit, your honor. <laughs> <laughs> They, they they all had to let her in the sport. They got they got a suspended sentence if they let her in the sport. Oh. And a couple of them were not sports guys at all. You know, oh, no. Real skinny. Ooh, dude, you know. So we're leaving the courtroom, the county, had, and uh, one of them said something to us. One of the guys. Uh -huh. You guys are gonna pay for this or something like that, you know. And it was just happened to be a reporter from the from the Miami. Uh, Daily News, the afternoon paper said, what? What was what, what's that all about? You know, oh, you want to know what that's all about? So we told her the whole story, and they put a picture on their front page of Burnett's car with the spaghetti on it. Now, I forgot to mention that, <coughs> that this happened during Courtesy Week. Wheel Club sponsored Courtesy Week, at this, where everybody be nice. So <laughs> the little headline said, Wheel Club climaxes Courtesy Week with a spaghetti throw on <laughs> Burnett's car. Oh, Jesus. Oh, no. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Oh, I learned how to drive on a 1936 Oldsmobile. Wow. When I was about seven or eight. 1936? Yeah. Jeez. When yeah. you were seven or eight? Yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. How about that? I had a big old stick shift on the floor. You know, a big, big throw. Mm -hmm. like, rah, 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 rah. So I, and I had, I couldn't see how the, you know, I went driving. I just at my grandmother's house. She, okay. she had an unpaved road that went to her house. Okay. You know? And I had to look up like this, and I go, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> That's what I learned to drive on, a 1936 old mobile. Wow. Yeah. yeah, it was an old car. It was an old mobile. I bet. Yeah. So when you were of age, what sort of car did you I had a, I had a 1951 Frasier Vagabond. Okay. Look it up. Google it. <laughs> the ugliest car. <laughs> I don't know why. Well, you know, I liked it because... It was actually a hatchback. It was a full-size car. It was a Fraser. Fraser was the uh, deluxe Kaiser, Kaiser Fraser, right? 
and it had uh, it had a hatchback, which was no, no other car had that, you know. But it was big and bulky and ugly, and you know, yeah, the old Fraser. So then I traded that and got the '51 Kaiser. Slipped with the Kaiser, oh you know, everybody else had the '56 Chevy, and you know, mm -hmm. yeah, '51 Kaiser. That's what it was. It cost 250 bucks. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And I drove that, oh yeah, the black one. Then I, oh, I wish I worked my way up to a green 51 Kaiser, which was a better, which was a better car than the first one, yeah. So I was a Kaiser Fraser guy. And this is all within like high school Yes, years. yeah. yeah. So I'm 16. Still, you own more cars in, just up until high school than I had in my whole life. <laughs> That's very impressive and not surprising at all. Oh, well, yeah. you know, the next one was a, uh, let's see, I, oh, I had a, a 52 Chrysler that dad gave me. Uh, Chrysler uh, Saratoga okay. with a Hemi, the first year of the Hemi, yeah, Hemi, cool. yeah, it, was, it had this ridiculous transmission, I can't remember, but it was a combination of a planetary gear system and a, a, a fluid drive, in other words, fluid drive is, is two discs, it's, one spins and oil between them makes the other one spin, that's how they work, okay. and it takes forever for things to get started, you know, they're not fast, they're smooth. Planetary gear system is one where you uh, automatically shifts. I mean, you, you, you had to lift up your foot. Okay. Yeah, so wow. low gear was up in here, and it was super low gear. Good Lord. And then second gear was was here, and then you had to lift up your foot to go into third gear. It was Jeez. an odd transmission, yeah. So it kind of negated the, the, the fact that it was really fast because it took you forever. Go, <laughs> yeah. It was like that. You know? <laughs> So that was, but that was, a, that was a cool car. What, uh, was, what was the last car that you owned before you joined the Navy? I, I uh, let's see, I had the, uh, I had a '51 Kaiser, and I traded that on a Dodge, '55 Dodge Royal. Really nice car, black and white, four door sedan. It wasn't very sporty, but it had a little V8, and that's the one I drove to California. I drove out to, to San Francisco uh -huh. from Florida. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was a good car. Yeah, I had a lot of fun in that. So before we wrap this up, um, what uh, inspired you to join the Navy? Vietnam. Whoa. Really? That's easy. The draft. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah. Interesting. That number was coming up. I never knew that. It's neat. So, uh... What year? 60. Yeah, the war was heating up. Yeah, the draft was real. It was real. It, well, I had been I had a deferment when I was in college, but I dropped out of college. Okay. And my ass was on the line. So, uh, two of my buddies, Butch Evans, you know that name, mm -hmm. uh, Lynn Watkins, you probably don't know, yeah, and myself, it was really Butch's idea. We decided to join the Navy. Well, first I went to the Air Force recruiter. He told me there were no musicians in the Air Force. Which I knew was wrong because I used to play over at McDill and I saw a band over there. Anyway, so we decided to go to the Navy recruiter, and uh, Butch, they give you they give you something called a monkey wrench test. That's the very first test to see if you have any brains at all. Mm -hmm. You know, you remember that one? Mm -hmm. No, really, is this a monkey wrench? Really, that's what it was wow. like. And Butch failed it. He did. That Butch, oh. yeah, the genius. I mean, he's an absolute certifiable genius. Wow. Yeah. He failed it. So he didn't go in the Navy, but what Lynn Watkins and I did. Okay. And that was the reason. And it was not a month or, I don't know, maybe three, six months later, my nine, nine number came up. I got a draft notice. Wow. And my ass would have been in Vietnam. Ooh. Oh, yeah. That close. No kidding. Yep. Yeah. Jeez. Sometime we'll talk about that, what it was like being in the military during Vietnam. That'll be people, right. people were not real fond of you. Yeah. yeah. They thought... They thought I was a policeman in San Francisco because I had a short haircut. Oh, jeez. I said, no, oh, no, no, I'm in the Navy. I said, well, actually, they accepted that more than they did cop, that's for sure. I bet they did, yeah. yeah. But that was, that was a different time. Mm -hmm. It really was. Some stuff happened. Never, nothing ever happened to me, but... Well, San Francisco will be our next installment. Okay. Then we'll have to get to Pensacola. That's, that's part of the Vietnam story, too, that whole man. Mm -hmm. Then Watergate. Watergate was a Navy band. Why, man? What if things gonna settle down, honest to God? You know? Give us a break here. Yep. Okay, cut. Okay. That's it. What's today? September first, twenty twenty.